Hello everyone, my name is Tavos Latakis and I'm a PhD student supervised by Dr. Maya Thano at King's College London Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I'm going to talk about the in vitro blood brain bio model that we're manufacturing in the lab and we're assessing the permeability of fluorescent molecules with a combination of, fo of ultrasound and faint shades nanodroplets. So the basic aim of this study is that we formulate this perfluorocarbon core lipid shell uh, nanodroplets characterize them and uh, then we assess the permeability of the endothelial cell membrane with a combination of ultrasound. So what's the state of the art at the moment? As most of you know, is microbubbles and there are small, a few micrometer diameter gas-filled bubbles with a phospholipid shell, very similar to nanodroplets. They're already approved as contrast agents and they're in phase two clinical trials recurrent glioblastoma with calathera. That's very important. That's what we're going to focus now. So uh, the main idea for that is that the application of focus ultrasound, they make these micro bubbles cavitating, they expand and contract, and they apply an energy deposition around them. And that makes the endothelial barriers permeable and leaky for a short period of time, which, which we can exploit when we want to achieve some drug targeting and delivery. So the main difference with nanodroplets is that our nanodroplets are smaller in size. They have higher stability in vivo and in storage conditions, and they have a lower temperature elevation when uh, you apply ultrasound on them. Another basic difference is that they have a liquid, a compressed liquid core, and uh, after the application of ultrasound and the acoustic droplet vaporization effect, they start the, the liquid core becomes gas. They sort of turning into micro bubbles and they start again cavitating, expanding, contra expanding contracting, and they uh, apply this energy deposition around the filial barriers. So, how make this uh, nanoparticles in our lab? It's a very easy to follow, very straightforward process with high reproducibility. So we just mix we just mix the lipids. We remove the organic solutions using using a rotor evaporator. And then we hydrate the lipid film, and after a series of hot and cold uh, bath sonications and the addition of perfluorocarbon, of course, we have our nanodroplets. Then we need to characterize them. And firstly, we use the DLS dynamic light scattering to measure the size. As we can see here, using lower boiling point perfluoropentane and higher boiling point perfluorohexane, we we can see that the size is a few like a hundred. 120 nanometers, the pore dispersity index, the PDI is acceptable rate. And most importantly, when we store them in the fridge, they remain relatively stable after seven, at least seven days. And after that, we thought that it's very important if we try and measure the amount and the loss of perfluorocarbon over time that's encapsulated inside the nanodroplet core. So we figure out a new uh, technique for that using fluorine nuclear magnetic measurements, fluorine NMR, to assess the perfluorocarbon loss uh, over al under storage conditions for a couple of weeks. And as we were expecting, there is a high loss with perfluorpentane nanodroplets, lower boiling point, comparing to uh, the perfluorhexane nanodroplets, but they can still cavitate, uh, as we've seen. So even that there is some loss they can still uh, be able to um, cavitate and be used for the experiments that we need them. So in order to confirm the cavitation, we asked the help of our collaborators from University of Glasgow, Paul and Santi. They have a high-speed camera that takes million frames per second. And as you can see here on the slide, there is a, we forced uh, the, uh, our nanodroplets through the capillary, a very thin capillary, and there is the application of ultrasound from that side, and uh, the high-speed camera is on top, taking millions of frames per second. And as you can see here on the video, in nanoseconds, there are tiny, tiny, tiny droplets that they expand and contract, expand and contract, captured by the high-speed camera. So we have the confirmation that all of our nanodroplet formulations, perfluorpentane or perfluorhexane core, they do cavitate after ultrasound application. Moving on to the cell studies now, there are two main and big studies in literature from Fixital that they're using 
uh, gastroendothelial cells, CACO2 cells, and uh, polymeric uh, nanodroplets. They, to assess that, they use fitidextran, the fluorescent molecule that's 50 kilodal, which is very big, and they assessed over two to three days with interesting data. And the other, the other team, Shen and Tal, that they're using the brain endothelial cells, the Bentry cells that we're going to use, we use, and as we'll see in, in, in the next few slides, they, they applied ultrasound and microbubbles to assess the permeation of the study. So what we've done, we created a blood-brain barrier model having our brain endothelial cells, Bentry cells on top of the synthet. And when we, they reach the uh, uh, acceptable confluency, we added the nanodroplets with the ultrasound uh, that we got from University of Glasgow, a handmade, a beautiful ultrasound, planar trans uh, transducer, planar transducer. And we use it like uh, 50 duty cycle and 0.67 megapascals. And after one hour of incubation uh, in the cell uh, incubator, we added the sodium fluorescein, very small molecule to assess the permeation. As, as you can see here, that's very interesting. 77% of sodium fluorescein after one hour has gone through the membrane when we use perfluorocarbon, lowering boil point, easy to activate. Compared to microbubbles and perfluorohexane, which perfluorohexane is harder to activate, we've seen that's far lower uh, permeation and membrane uh, permeability comparing to the perfluorpentane, which was very interesting. But after that, we wanted to visualize uh, our results and to see what's happening in the membrane. That's why it's the main part of the study. We use the live dead cell imaging kit with FITSI and Texas Red, FITSI for the live cells and Texas Red for the dead cells. And as you can see here on the images, our positive control that killed all the cells with 50%, with 70% of ethanol, everything is red. When we used, we didn't use ultrasound. Every one hour incubator, all cells were fine. When you use only ultrasound, similar results but when we use combined nano droplets or micro bubbles we have some holes we have some cell death and as we move on to have a better look so when we combine ultrasound and nano droplets we've seen that there is there are some cell death some holes but generally the membrane is remaining a little bit leaky but not that much damage Comparing to the microbubbles that we have, like lots of big holes that create like a very damaged membrane that might not be very good for in vivo studies. So moving on, we thought that thinking forward, when we're going to start testing this in animals, we need to somehow track where our nano droplets go. So we combine this formulation with fluorescent, with near infrared dyes, and we've seen that they have really good size and PDI data. And also using photoacoustic imaging ex vivo, we've seen here after the injection and the laser activation that we can see our nano droplets in vivo. So concluding remarks, we have acceptable sites and storage stability of at least seven days of our nano droplets. The F uh, the fluorine enema and the high-speed camera confirm the perfluorocarbon amount and the gravitation of our nano droplets. We've seen increased permeation percentage with ultrasound and nano droplets comparing to microbubbles. However, the microbubbles damaged and created holes into the monolayer of the model. And also, last but not least, we have some uh, label near infrared label nano droplets where we can track in vivo and image image them where they're going after uh, intravenous injection. So the future work is that we're going to keep optimizing the model, make it more closer to the blood-brain barrier one with astrocytes and cancer cells and thinking of how we're going to move forward with uh, in vivo experiments. And I would like to thank all of the members of TAN Group, King's College London, and of course, the University of Glasgow that they uh, helped us with cavitation detection and my industrial partners from Farmidex, Mo Mohammed and Chris for their help and support. I'll be there if you have any questions and thank you very much for your attention.